So hello everyone and welcome. This is the first session of our workshop, prompt, uh, of our prompt ranking workshop, hybrid intelligence, generative AI and human creativity. And I'm Rafael, I'm moderating the session for today. I'm going to briefly read the description for the workshop and uh, while afterwards I'm going to introduce our instructors uh, who are going to be uh, with us throughout the, the workshop and uh, yes. So in this eight session workshop, split into two modules and featuring uh, a lot of guests who have been experimenting with AI tools, we will work within the emergent field of AI powered content creation and tap into its potential to augment and enhance human creativity. Uh, oriented towards the hybrid intelligence of the human and the machine to achieve a common goal, participants will learn about prompt writing, true exercises, and managing the output of multiple AI tools. They'll produce works that neither humans nor machines can achieve independently. Uh, participants can work in their own animated proje uh, storytelling project using ChatGPT and other tool, uh, AI tools like Stable Diffusion and MidJourney, providing text to image, text to video, text to uh, audio, video to video, and image to image output, as well as voice creation. The aim here is to create narratives that go beyond the conventional boundaries of non-AI media. And participants will also learn how to deal with the ethical implications of AI in content creation and the need for responsible use of technology, including concerns about job displacement, bias uh, in AI algorithms, and the political considerations around using AI to create content that can deceive or manipulate audiences. And uh, with, together with us here, we have instructors uh, Sebastian Zimmerhackel and Jumoke Hernandez. I'll begin with Jumoke Hernandez's bio. Uh, Jumoke Fernandez is uh, mm -hmm. art director and creative lead, specializing in the realm of mobile games and entertainment apps. With a dedication to knowledge and artistic expression, she embodies the role of a young self-taught digital visionary and uh, embracing the last frontiers of technological advancements encompassing augmented reality, blockchain, and artificial intelligence. Uh, with her unwavering passion, uh, passion for transformative technology, she feels that her drive to new possibilities and push the boundaries of artistic expression in the digital age, and her ability to predict, learn, and executive creative trends is an invaluable asset for uh, any project that wants to exist and wants to make waves in the digital ecosystem. Uh, Sebastian zimmer uses the interconnectedness of the internet as his medium, hyper aware of the styles and technologies being used around the world, and uh, as a 360 degrees creative technologies director, disruptive mentition and networker, he manifests vivid relationships for big projects in technology, fashion, art, and communication design. Sebastian is the digital fire that never goes out or walks off and constantly keeping the corners of the internet illuminated with radical imagination. And uh, yes, uh, with that introduction, I'm uh, passing the word to Jamoke and Sebastian. Uh, please take it away. Thank you for the word. I will share now my screen and explain you where, how we are doing the next minutes together. So we are here. We will do a 30 minute um, overview about uh, certain things. Then we give you a 10 minute um, little information about the guests. And then we will roughly 15 minutes show you the tools which we will learn um, in this seminar. I, I will also share all the information now in the chat. And um, for me, it's very important that we collectively uh, yeah, have a protocol or select question, collect questions here in the chat. And then uh, you more can ask. I will later on over the week um, answer these questions. So we have here um, the link list protocol, and then I make another um, um, for the questions itself, you know. And just if you have the interesting links or anything, uh, I love uh, the collective aspect of so many people in a chat room. Um, also, here is the complete overview about uh, what we will do in the, the next eight sessions. I already shared this in the uh, in the chat that you see it, but I will start now with the first thirty minutes. It's from a talk which we gave um, in front of politicians in Luxembourg, and um, I'm looking forward. We give you a speed run also. 
uh, we share all the list, uh, the links are uh, here. So there's the full talk and also the full slide. So if you want to watch all the music videos that we did, we will really just go quick through these. Um, yes, after 5,000 years of civilization, we probably all need a break. Um, so everyone is awake now, strobo, strobo, getting there. Um, Disclaimer, the graphics and visuals in this presentation have been generated using artificial intelligence and no machines were harmed. Um, yes, we call it Radical Imagination XD and the XD represents the unlimited aesthetical dimensions which are possible. The unlimited variations which you see also later further. So we'd like to have fun, we smile and we make unlimited variation. Um, in this short presentation, we, we show some case studies, uh, text to image, text to text, yeah, basically on the long run text to everything. And we explain you a little bit about the current workflows and also what we think the future might bring. Um, AI tools and the continuous research and development. Um, yeah, what, what does this basically mean for the futures of crafts and arts? And um, today is absolutely not about ethics or programming of all these things because we are, we call ourselves law creatives. We are not lawyers. So all those um, yeah, regulations or um, all this stuff is, 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 is very, very complex. Also, we wanted to mention that on this presentation, a large group of people were participating and already thank you for everyone who helped to uh, get this stuff together um, as we're working in a in a quite big uh, online network and um, did several iterations of this talk. Um, the generative age, like artificial intelligence will do for content production, what the internet did for distribution. So we are absolutely in uh, a very fast change as we also think that, um, yeah, most of all digital media will somehow include artificial intelligence and um, we see this really since yeah a year roughly you know so um also the cost of knowledge will 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 go down and people uh, yeah can learn a lot with jet gpt and and other tools and personal assistant and all the possibilities um, we also think that the cost of information will go down and uh, basically it, yeah, welcome to the fifth industrial revolution. We are now in the procedural and the generative age, which is very potent. I, even in like, I don't know, I spoke with a coder where we did uh, AI work already in 2015 and, and he did uh, thousands of pictures with with algorithm and, and code i think um yeah picasso and all the other masters would definitely work with generative uh art it's interesting um uh, moke is working in this like game section where is a lot of complexity and it's also ai um is basically there uh, in okay. real time yeah in, in, in real time the images uh are already coming out really really good right so yeah but there's still uh some progress that needs to be made in terms of moving image and music and the most complex would be anything that's involving sort of like 
3D assets, and that's why games are a more complex task for this one. Yes. Um, <clears throat> all this uh, text to 3D and long-term then the voice to 3D and all the other things. Um, yeah, Yumoke is working with a, yeah, a, a platform where they absolutely super fast can skin an unreal world, but uh, just with one picture. So it's absolutely interesting how fast certain things go with AI workflows. It's, it's, it's absolutely a constant wow effect. Um, okay, speed run. Here is the one of, um, yeah, in a larger team, we could create together with the session um, photographer and uh, the team from Base uh, Digital. Uh, we shot the um, Kylie Jenner for the first um, cover of the Days Beauty. So that's one of the first um, beauty covers. Um, and at that time, I think uh, Jenna had one of the biggest Instagram accounts. It's very, very interesting. Um, also, you can see several interviews which are linked in the link list and stuff. So here you see at one of the first um, yeah, beauty pictures uh, done with AI. Very happy that she used um, the pictures in her studio quite big. And it gave us a buzz, but at that time, we were just like experimenting with AI. We didn't thought about this. We are, we have to do the first cover or stuff like that. It was just very, very interesting. With the rest of the team, we discussed how can we make typefaces? How can we make logos with AI? We want to experiment with this stuff. And at the end, we did many things, as you see here, the beauty gun stuff. Very interesting lenticular uh, art pieces, and um, which led us basically to one of the first uh, music videos with AI. This was together with Universal Records. Um, yeah, my team has very good uh, connections to this label, and we continuously uh, can produce fully AI generated uh, music videos for rock, techno, or hip-hop and stuff. It's very nice that the industry gives us a lot of freedom. Uh, here we included uh, deepfake and uh, very interesting things. Also, parts of the team is doing like, yeah, the coding work, AI architecture. Um, so the network has also skills in these things, not to be mentioned. Here is a wonderful example how you create a logo uh, with generative AI. So the logo becomes a yeah, part of a story. Um, we were very happy about that as it's nearly one year ago uh, where we created for this uh, interesting project from uh, LA calls um, this logo. Very happy, super exciting if you experiment with something and um wonderful things come out here as i mentioned before is one of the fully ai generated music videos um yes i'm very very happy about that this is already as a year ago and it's 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 very interesting um to work with these uh, think stable diffusion here you see you we segmented the artist so basically you can uh, 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 prompt the video in, in, in any direction you know now it's David Hockney uh, and you can always mix uh, several artists this is what we are really focusing on in this seminar also as you see here um, not loading proper usually the video would play um, but no problem you can watch the rest online but the interesting thing is on the left side is bull, on the right side is more organic. So it's absolutely just one prompt and you change the whole scene. Um, further on other things, I give it a little bit, uh, I, I go faster through it. Here's something that 
a coder friend Max did for a techno label from Berlin. So um, reworking with an algorithm uh, existing film to material and car videos. Also, um, I'm very happy about that with a, with a larger team from Miami, uh, Vienna and Berlin. We are working on something that we call MTV for AI. So this will be a very interesting project. Uh, that's actually what uh, I and the rest of the team are super uh, working on to get this kind of out of um, yeah out of the um, out of the ground. So we are searching currently funding and stuff like that, and um, that helps us to curate or just like to map uh, yeah basically the most interesting artists as we really want to showcase them uh, yeah and our platform and really want to yeah gain a momentum and help people to uh, yeah exhibit together worldwide and stuff. Also, uh, a part of the team and friends are working on an AI operation system. You can also check this axiom plus xd.com, which is very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, long-term uh, open source and basically how will the well the world uh, become and stuff like this. Here are also three more uh, videos. It was like Kazabian, uh, Magdalena Bay, um, and as I said before, you can watch them uh, online and I'm always happy to, to talk and walk through those workflows. Um, welcome 2022, which we call the birth year of synthography and the creation of synthetic artificial intelligence. So all those images are created um, by us in enormous speed using um, this tool called Midjourney um, and it's text, text to picture. Uh, what's so interesting about all those tools that it has like a mass adoption. Um, absolutely exploding and in just few days they had millions of people using this tool and uh, it's continuously growing um, yes fascinating um, yes that's what we start with the text to image I think everyone heard about that you write a prompt generate the picture and then you can elaborate this is really starting from the basic examples, text uh, to image, just like shoe and stone, futuristic stuff, other shoes, super futuristic. I really go fast through these things. Wonderful masks from Jumoke, interesting lightning scene, architecture stuff, sketches, bags, fantasy tents. Again, 3D pieces, even effect pedals, storytelling which is super important for our friends, Internet Neon, which are also part of the seminar. The closer you get to your thoughts, you can create the story. All this is part of the seminar. We get, ah, XX scene, like a graphic novel. You, each picture gets you in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in another emotional state. It's very interesting. And with those tools, Midjourney, XXX, uh, you can create this very fast if you, if you understand uh, certain points. Um, beautiful um, pictures. And also, I mean, long term, this is the stuff that you more care. Sebastian, the rest than, uh, yes? uh, Sebastian, sorry to interrupt you. There is a slight uh, interference with your audio. Could you uh, perhaps switch to the, like from the headphone to the computer, perhaps with the microphone, just to see if it gets better. Is this, is this really so hard? No, no, it's just a little bit. Just, uh, can, can you say something again, please? Test, 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 test. Hello. I yeah, usually it's... have never problems with this. Okay. Yeah, it's just, it's just a tiny bit depending on the words. Uh, do you do, do you want to try with the internal mic from the computer? No, I usually have never problems. You know, like um, okay. the, the 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 system. Uh, 
uh, is is kind of running. I mean, if okay, okay, yeah. if I need, you know, um, okay, all fine, wonderful pictures. I mean, long term, in two or three years, you can't understand the difference between an AI avatar and a real picture. You know, now it's just the beginning of of things. Um, Yumoka is doing every day a wonderful AI portrait of herself and is only using uh, those AI generated portraits to basically protect her identity, um, which is an interesting discussion. But we are slowly or like absolutely fast better uh, heading into this kind of, uh, yes, that you don't understand if it's created with AI or if it's a real picture. Um, from comic, super small worlds, fantasy weapons, wonderful game sketches in, 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 in seconds, super scenes. It's, it's super interesting to very fast visualize things. And you see, I'm, I'm quite excited about these things because finally I have a tool which, which is like producing, producing, producing in, um, in an enormous speed. And um, I can really, yeah, try many things, which, which, um, which we really like, because we can work on multiple things at the same time, and then give it to another person to finish playing ping pong with certain things. This is a graphic that Yumoka fully created on the mobile phone. So prompting on the phone and then reworking it with an app. So absolutely possible to make a music video these days with with a phone in bed. Um, yes, we will learn the generative, uh, the Gen 2 from one runway and certain things. Yes, beautiful character development, beautiful manga direction. Yes, boom, 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 ideas for shoots, uh, creating an AI model of, uh, yeah, all, all those models are not real, created with AI. You got me, fashion studies. Yeah, how do you see the difference, you know? Uh, wonderful game. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that people already, you know, it's uh, already at a point with certain images where you can't tell the difference. Even people that are working with these tools are no longer always able to differentiate. And I even had this happen to me a couple of weeks ago because the prime minister of the UK uh, suffered a little personality attack where someone used generative AI to transform mm -hmm. part of the image. And all they had done was taken this real photo of the prime minister and he was pulling a pint of beer. And all they did, it was kind of harmless, but they, they made it look like he hadn't pulled a very good pint and they changed the face of the woman next to him to make her look like, you know, she was giving him a bit of a look from the side. Yeah. And I wasn't, I saw this just going around on the internet and I actually didn't know that it was AI generated. So I think we're already at that point, to be honest. Yeah, um, Yumok and I, we give a cybersecurity workshop on the 9th of September. And we are currently collecting all those stories about cybersecurity. So even a, a, one of the bosses of a Chinese software company got faked with deep fake technology. So it's very interesting all the the aspects of what we um yeah teach you or show. For us it's also very important to discuss uh cybersecurity. That's just something which we also wanted to mention and happy um to discuss these things as we need to discuss the power and also the uh, the potential risks and things like this. Um, part of today is like focusing on this thing called chat GPT, so which will be text to text. Um, yes, 
pretty self-explanating. This is like absolutely for beginner. So you just like uh, give me a meal plan for one week. Boop. You can really ask this thing everything. And yeah, you always need to be critical about what it says and stuff, but it's a beautiful ping pong starter. And uh, sometimes, or yeah, like let's rewrite this or just let's write this in the style of whoever and all these kind of things. It's, um, yeah, I, uh, I'm i not working without uh, something like this. Personally, I always was better ping pong writing with people, even sitting next to each other. But now I have a machine that gives me an input. Can you write this longer? Can you write five more sentences? It's absolutely a super nice ping pong. Uh, here are just funny tweets about JGPT inventing emotion. Um, and also super interesting how teachers can use the text to text. Uh, really important. Um, yes. To, yeah. In the future, you will have um, personalized lessons for each student. And um, uh, that, um, yes, this, this, this will be the interesting thing. Also long term, the assistant and, and just like tools that help you to spark your curiosity and things, um, as I mentioned before, uh, things like uh, jet GPT debugging of code or just like a constant co-pilot in these things. Um, it's, I could speak forever to explain you the tools which are coming, but this is constantly changing. You know, this is, this is, there is um, so much energy in this. Um, I have an old friend. He, he was, yeah, back then the first internet bubble and he said all this generative AI bubble energy is 10 times what happened uh, back then with the internet. There is like an absolute run on all these, on this thing. Um, Sebastian, sorry, sorry to interrupt you again. I think the like the, the background noise is escalating a little bit. Could you please try to like get to the headphones out and perhaps use the computer audio and it usually solves uh, during that. I think there's some interference with the... Okay, I will do this. Probably there are uh, enough people in the in the thing. Sorry for for the... Okay, it's much better now. Uh, everybody, everybody, right? Okay. Sorry. Uh, usually I don't have this. Um... Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, there are so many uh, possibilities, you know, um, you write something and then it creates a song um, in Beethoven, brainwaves to text, just like absolutely, um, there are so many possibilities. Um, the XD. Mm. Yumoke, you know this, uh, this? Yeah, no, I think this was a... A photographer um, who had a legal battle around their final piece at university due to AI and um, I think it was uh, they used AI in their in their final piece which is quite uh, interesting. Yes absolutely um, all those discussions about copyright and regulations and all that stuff um, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, out of all this text to everything and, and, and the tools, uh, generative AI, there will be basically a new art form comes of that. New trends, a cure, new music videos, new, new everything will come out of that. Um, yeah, and the art will use it. Here's like a, a piece of work that uh, Max Kreis did um, using large uh, picture models, uh, I mean, data set and, 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 and yeah, and creating new visuals. 
Um, he is also a wonderful project that he did for Magdalena Bay, as I mentioned before. Um, it's absolutely stunning visuals, um, worth to watch it. It's like, um, yeah. Yeah, what's really mm -hmm. interesting about this is that he worked on this video, I think it was only a year and a half ago, or two years. And since then, there's already been so many developments in this field, you can actually make a video like this now just on your mobile phone. But back then, it needed uh, huge data sets and training knowledge of Python in order to be able to make this kind of stuff. But the uh, barrier to entry for these tools is just getting lower and lower. Well, that's, it's, it's really because Max or other people, they work really hard to achieve something. And then two months later, you can there are super powerful tools. So it's absolutely a, a run with time or these kind of things. Um, also very stunning generative um, art, Refit Anadol, probably some people saw this already. And here you see some workflow uh, examples. So creating a mood board for the existing shoot. So this is the fast uh, moods. Then you can talk with the clients. Okay, we will probably shoot it like this. Boom. And at the end for the campaign, you make these pictures. What's so interesting about um, this technology is that you can always re-prompt an image. So this is the original picture. And you just like create a different angle or different world. Um, so if you want to make an editorial, you just basically need one picture and, and prompt all the other scenes itself. Wonderful textures. Um, yeah, this is some um, stable diffusion stuff. So you're able to pose a character and then use that as the basis for your render, essentially. Yes. Also wonderful is the outpainting. Um, I do this often with like the new um, uh, Photoshop beta, but there are also other uh, professional tools to outpaint. Um, super interesting. Yeah. And basically so, what you can do is you select a part of the image and then you can just reprompt that bit. So for example, with the with this image, we could select the apple and say, I want her to hold a fish instead. And then it puts a fish there. Yeah, and this one is again, so how you could take a, a reference photo and use that to create more images in the same style. So for example, in this case, you would take that image, put it into mid journey and then get similar images out. So essentially you could do a photo shoot and just come out with three pictures, but then use those three pictures to create 300 pictures. Yeah, 3000 <clears throat> and changing the model and all these kind of things. Here is something interesting. Um, <clears throat> this is a German musician. Um, we trained um, a custom AI model. We've just like in five minutes or two minutes, we take some pictures from uh, YouTube. It's not even uh, filmed or new photos for him. And then we, we can basically create, yeah, him in all scenes. This was kind of like in the uh, Godfather direction, but also we can create unlimited memes. So he can become Lord of the Ring, he can become Shrek and all these kind of things. Um, it's it's extremely funny. Here <clears throat> we did the same with like this musician Post Malone. Um, again, training 20, 30 pictures on him and make fantasy pictures. So in this seminar, you learn the same. So we can train uh, an avatar on your own face and basically um, make your new profile pictures or merchandise or anything you know and um, 
<clears throat> the winning question, what does it mean for the future? Um, we think it will be everywhere. Um, <clears throat> and also expect the majority of junior to mid-level jobs to be radically transformed by 24. So basically, while being in this uh, seminar over the next three months, and then many things are changing. So for Yumoke at the computer game, for concept artists, there was a, a quick transition. And um, yeah, this will be part of the ongoing conversation um, of the seminar. Um, yeah. Here's a list of the jobs at the edge of transformation. Photo models, as I said, concept artists, graphic designers, photographers, manga, comic drawers, illustrators, videographers, motion designers, fashion designer, product designer. All related jobs like assistant, retoucher, um, then lawyers, journalists, writers, programmers, musicians, data scientists, customer support, retail workers and all related jobs like assistants, secretaries, dot, dot, dot. Um, yeah, entire industries would put their value into question. A new transformation of jobs is coming. It won't be limited to creative workers. Actually, it will affect the creative people um, first. <laughs> um, <clears throat> quite interesting that computer growth was was doubling always all two years. Now it's like probably in, 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 in double exponential growth on steroids. So the computer is doubling the, 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 the power all three months. You know, like in, in the seminar, already the next um, powerful uh, graphic card and the rest is, is, is out. Um, Again, every popular story will be AI augmented in every style and every age group, language, and every other individual preference. So it's just showing the complete XD. And um, here's a very interesting text from our partner uh, from Neon Internet, who will also be part of the uh, seminar. You can read it on the link. Um, also, uh, another thing, infinite monkey theory, interesting texts to go over it. But what it's <clears throat> actually happening is um, you can make from any original infinite variations. So what this means is you have endless inspiration. Heinz von Förster is a very interesting um, persona. Ableiten, immer weiter ableiten. For all the Germans in the class. Um, Yumoke, you can explain that. It's I'm like... I just sorry, I don't know what this is supposed to mean. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, it means just like um, analog art. Um, uh, is like making pictures from reality and digital art is also um, recreating analog art and reality and uh, the human imagination um, is all these things. And like the, the new AI art creates things that yeah um, are very complex and, um, and stuff. So it will integrate all of these uh, things itself. I mean, we spoke about the extreme fast adoption already. <clears throat> and um, also very interesting is that we grew up, uh, uh, our parents told us don't trust everything on the internet. And now we need to tell our friends and family don't trust anything on the internet. And when I mean anything, it's absolutely now would be the perfect time to reveal my real face because this is just an AI avatar, you know? So we can create synthetic voices and um, avatars. And as we just mentioned before, we really need to, yeah, 
aware and um, yeah, question many things, anything. Um, so we are in a new era, the age of mechanical reproduction, Walter Benjamin is basically over and we are now in the age of artificial reproduction. Um, back then it was like, wow, we can make infinite copies of the Mona Lisa. But now it's like, wow, we can make infinite variations of the Mona Lisa. So Walter Benjamin is on the left and we are on the right. Um, also here's like the value of the synthographic object. The person that created the image loves it. So, and also <clears throat> the text from Mish and the TED talk goes more about these things. Um, just a funny meme from the internet. Um, yeah, it's the it's the man machine. We are working now together on all these things. Uh, I thought it's quite funny to 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 close with the Bible. So what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the, the sun. But is with the AI. Uh, did a new sun appear? So um, our conclusion is basically uh, in 2022, a new creative medium has been unlocked. We call it synthography. Other people call it promptography. Uh, Yomoke and I, we are team synthography, by the way. Um, also, AI will not replace humans. Kind of a person that can work with AI will replace a person that is not so skilled with AI. Um, also what's beyond the uncanny valley that we will yeah, find out together. Uh, thank you for now. This was the first 30 minutes. Um, okay. How is everyone? Good, good, good. Okay. Um, this was the first block of everything. Um, I'm very happy. Um, yeah, that Mohammed uh, gave us the opportunity to to teach here and to get into what a nice exchange with you. Also, um, yeah, I'm I'm absolutely stunned by all the people that the um, uh, Mohammed and uh, the team pulled off. So um, I'm super looking forward to the first uh, guest. Of course, it will be the, 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 the leader of the school, Mr. Salini later. I think he will join in 10 minutes or something like that. He prepared a 30 minutes talk. I think most of the people know him. Um, one of the first workshops or I mean like guest lectures will be on the 13th of um, September we have John Refman it's a very interesting artist I'm a big fan uh, of his work and I'm following since a long time so I'm also very um, yeah stunned and motivated um, to go th with him through the visual storytelling I just know uh, from interviews that he's um, in, um, um, yeah, in, 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 in deep contact with the mid-journey coders and he's using the text to image tools since a quite long time with people. Um, then later we go through the generative um, video production um, with Neo Internet, Elliot Highmore and Umid Yildiz. All those are people uh, we were working on music videos together. That's super interesting. And um, with Romulo, um, he's using audio as a medium, as also a writer. Uh, but um, Mr. Salemi knows more what he will contribute to the whole uh, seminar. And um, we will basically close. Uh, also, that the last guest will be Erica because with her we wanted to discuss where is this leading what is what does this to philosophy and um, the future of art um 
Super. Um, let's go through the tools. Another 15 minutes and then more is coming to these things. So I already shared with you the list for the for the class and stuff. And basically you see here with the tools, okay, Jet GPT, Ybot. Um yeah, perfect. Yumoka, how should we do it with the with the tools? Yeah, I can maybe talk through what we'll do in each of these main sessions. Um so on the first session, which is today, uh, we are going to be focusing on text to text. And the main outcome for what we want to create today is sort of this narrative overview and script, which is going to inform our image generation in the next sec uh, session. So basically, the idea is, is that at the end of this series of workshops, we have a either an animated graphic novel or some sort of uh, storytelling piece. So today we'll basically be learning how to use ChatGPT and Ybot in order to yeah, create a, a narrative and a script that we can then take into the next session. And yeah. for, yeah. And for the next session uh, for the image generation, We'll be playing around with Midjourney if we, for those who have a subscription on Midjourney. But if not, then there are some free alternatives, and we would then be using Stable Diffusion, Dali, and uh, another tool for upscaling the images. And in this session, basically, what we'll be doing is we'll be taking the narrative that we've made today. And we'll be trying to create images to flesh that out and start to basically build these scenes. And at the end of that, uh, we should all have 10 images that kind of laid out, tell this story. So we can think of it sort of as a storyboard in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, then... and with John Refman, on the 13th of September, we go really into visual storytelling and world building. Absolutely. And what's really important is that, uh, you know, if you can always go away after the end of the session and continue to play with these tools. And basically the structure that we're going to do is at the beginning of each session, then we will all show what we made in the last one. But you can also go away and do some stuff in between, essentially. And yeah, after we've made a bunch of images, then we're going to look at video, video generation. So we'll be using a bunch of different tools, including Runway, Kyber, Replicate, and Wonder Dynamics. And essentially, there's a lot of different things in there, but we'll be exploring text to video. So writing text prompts in order to create videos from scratch but also image to video. So, you know, uploading an image and then creating a video from that image itself. Yes, this is super interesting. We are also just working with the Runway Gen 2, which is a picture to video program. We just working on an e-bike for a BMW and we really experiment with this. Also, one of the next things for us will be yeah, creating a music video and all that stuff. So we are not that far away. Um, and it's really uh, be very happy to 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 test all these tools. It will help you uh, to create new worlds. Um, this this is very very uh, exciting. Um, this is the video generation. Also beautiful is that like uh, we have three, four friends joining the stuff and they're really happy for us to teach this and they 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 they, they come with a lot of knowledge and, and power. And for the then the, 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 the guest section um here we will go we through can leave 
we can leave this one to Mohammed. I think it would be nice if he explains uh, these two a little bit more. And then we yes. can jump to the the sound one because yeah. um, that will be a lot of fun as well. Because in this session, we will explore training a sound model on our voices. And you'd be super surprised how easy it is, actually. You really only need to have a recording of someone speaking for three minutes in order to accurately mm -hmm. Uh, create one of these models and in general it's such an interesting topic uh, which has such mixed reviews also if you're interested in music uh, Grimes for example she has released her voice as uh, an AI model that all of her fans can use to create music so just in general it's quite an interesting one so we'll be exploring training the model and we'll also be exploring text to sound. So how can we use uh, text prompts to create uh, not only sound effects, but also full tracks. And we'll be exploring image to sound because all of these things, whether it's an image or sound or text, it's all language. That's how the AI sees it. You know, the image is language, video is language. Mm -hmm. So essentially, that is the XD, right? Is that we can do anything to anything. So we'll be exploring image to sound as well, uploading an image and then getting a, a track from it. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting. It 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 reads the 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 the, the, the vibe of the of the picture and then creates x x seconds for that. Um, this is the the, the sound stuff. Then again, we leave this to Mo uh, because he knows the person better. But we are very interested in yeah, the direction of the future of work and the future of the arts. These are the, 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 the things that we want to discuss with this seminar member. And of course, at the last session, we... We watch, we, we watch all the, the created stuff together. And um, for us, it's very important that every member documents the things well. I'm very interested to create a digital book out of this, um, out of this teaching and also all the wonderful uh, creations to get these things together. Um, yes, so probably creating a book uh, out of the documentation and each person will have a gra graphic novel but also with 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 audio and um yes super interesting um now we are waiting for mo yeah i i i wanted to make a comment about uh, about some of the guests because i have uh... Both Erica and uh, Homolo were featured, and I I was also I was also there, uh, in the conference we organized together with ESAP, a roundtable on ChatGPT in particular, right? And I think that there was uh, I think that there was a particularly striking thing about both of their contributions. This video, I think Mohammed's going to talk more about this conference in particular, but um, mm -hmm. uh, we we had a, a bunch of conversations about ChatGPT and basically. Uh, how it affects the future. One, one of the things that I find really interesting about uh, Homolo's work and uh, that I would briefly mention is that Homolo has an attention to the to, to the relationship between media, narrativization and music, right? So uh, I, I remember like one particular piece that I remember him presenting was about uh, the Walkman and how the Walkman uh, as a device actually changes the perception of time of people when they are actually like putting a soundtrack in their own lives, right? There's a certain cinematic quality that gets invested into your own experience when you are when you are uh, when you are within a particular media device. And uh, yeah, about about Erica, I remember she. She presented something. I think Erica is actually might might be around auditing the session, and she can she can jump uh, in. Wow. To... What? It's my computer. He's he told me that it's ah, twenty okay. o'clock. <laughs> ah okay. 
Uh, wow, well, I got startled for yeah. machine revolution, right? And uh, okay, so yeah, Erica, I think is around. She can compliment me if she wants, but I do remember. Uh, I I think there there is one particular presentation of hers that was always very interesting to me, which is also uh, how the relationship between art and on the one hand some particular language codes, and on the other hand also how. That there is a there is a particular form to how English is used to describing artworks and everything and like a, that creates a certain jargon heavy uh perception of uh, the work of art and also of the activities around uh, art such as curating exhibition and everything and uh, I think yeah I, I think that's a very that, that's a that's a very compelling argument that in general they have been exploring. I wanted to throw a question actually at uh, both of you in a way because I, I think there's two things about your presentation that I found really fascinating. One of them is the uh, is about actually the the difference between the input and output. So that when you were talking about like dealing with let's say text and text uh, in input and output, and when you're dealing with uh, other particular forms, right? So when you're dealing with a cross between different mediums, uh, so for example, you have a text to image instead of an image to image. Do you how, how do you feel that these uh, do you feel that this changes fundamentally the output? Is there some technical background around that that makes this uh, how I'm very curious about the equalization in a way that happens between one. So like how these do these mutual different uh, different mediums get read by one another, right? So... Yeah, in theory, it shouldn't really change the output if you were able to write a text description that was exactly the same as that image, right? And I think the thing is with the text to image is that it requires you to actually, even in a lot of cases, to uh, really understand and command the English language because all of these generative AI models were trained in English. Um, so yeah, that is the, the fundamental difference, right? Is that for text to image and text to video, you need to be able to write. But to find an image that you like is somewhat a little bit easier. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this. I'm going to I'm going to introduce Mohammed really, really quickly, uh, so he can deliver. So, hello, Mohammed. Let me just uh, read the bio really quickly. And uh, Mohammed's an the independent uh, Berlin-based artist, critic, and curator from Canada, holding a BFA from Amerikar University and an MA in Critical Curatorial Studies from British Columbia. And uh, he has shown his works in Ashkal of One's Homeworks, Peter David, and Robert Love. And his writings have been published in Eflux, Flash Art, Third Rail, Brooklyn Rail, Opla, uh, Arts of the Working Class, and Spike, and many, many, many others. And uh, his curatorial experiment was also featured in the 11th Bonjour Biennale. And he's also, with the changing cast, uh, for, uh, forming the uh, Artist Collective Alphabet Collection. And he is also the organizer of the new center and the uh, Co uh, co founding member since 2013. So, Mohammed, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me, Sebastian and Jamoka, to do a little introduction. As you know, I've been concerned with this question uh, ever since Google started Google Brain in 2013. We all thought this types of AI will emerge out of Google. But as we all know, Google is a very like, lazy and uh, dysfunctional company so despite the fact that they were in on it longer than uh, open ai and other systems uh, they're behind but i remember discussing the emergence of this type of ai out of like uh out of the google books project right because the google brain was supposed to be where the knowledge gained out of scanning all the books that google books was doing was supposed to create this type of like predictable AI machines that would then be able to understand and respond to questions. And they were supposed to build it into Google search engines, right? Now, uh, a decade later, almost a decade later, last October when ChatGPT became available, I immediately joined and began 
working with it and thinking about ways that an artist or a writer can use it. And that's when I started to think that it would be amazing to get people who are like more engaged with these platforms on a creative level to teach a seminar or a workshop actually for us. So this is how the idea of this workshop came about. I don't want to talk too much and do too much of intro. I don't know how many of you had a chance to read Boris Groys's From Writing to Prompting, AI as Zeitgeist Machine. But I will wrap around my presentation, very short one. I don't want to take up too much time of the class. Consider this the sort of like theoretical, one of the, one of the few theoretical components of the workshop because this workshop is mostly hands-on and it's about you not deeply engaging with the philosophies of uh, AI and platforms like ChatGPT and MidJourney, but to actually use them and sort of like develop your philosophical insights through practice. And then hopefully you're able to incorporate your, your findings and your insights into these hands-on projects that you'll be doing individually or, or collectively as a result of the workshop. So to me, just to say it right off the bat, what these systems will end up automating is the actual, the, what Boris Groys already in the first paragraph of his text talks about in terms of the manual activity of writing, the sitting there and typing word by word and trying to craft sentences that are like correct spelling wise and in, in terms of syntax and grammar, right? That's the part that these, softwares, especially the text one with which I'm more familiar, will be automating. And what will be left for the human mind is the authentic part, the creative part. That part, we're far from outsourcing to machines. And maybe we get into it a little bit later. Why do I think like that? There's a quote in the I want to like read read off the text a little bit from the page one. If you go to the very first paragraph underneath the, the example prompts, it says writing on the contrary is a lonely activity, a last chance for an individual to produce something stable in our unstable world. At least since Derrida, it has become untenable to believe that a writer can stabilize their intention. Ultimately, we cannot know what an author wanted to say but a piece of writing is a combination of letters and not of intentions. Right off the bat, we see here in, in, in Groys's text, his tendency to sort of like look at the material reality of knowledge produced by humans or by machine. And as you might have seen later, basically says at the moment of output, the authenticity doesn't matter anymore because what machines and humans output at the moment of the last instance of output, they're just a bunch of letters string together. Doesn't matter if a genuine human did that or a machine did that, right? I take some I take I take some issues with this because I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, I don't think you can reduce a knowledge produced by human or machine to just a string of letters even even if our existing machines right now are only able to string out letters and predict the next word and the next sentence based on the large language models upon which they depend for stringing together these letters i think it's important to realize that uh whether at the, at the level of prompt prompt writing or at the level of receiving the result of the prompt, something happens between the, the human mind who's writing the prompt and giving it to the machine and the human mind on the other end that receives the result and digest it that transform the strings of text back into something more than just a string of text, which means giving it context, giving it meaning, giving it value and deciding upon its worth and its place in our individual and collective memory. And that is something that is what we will have to depend on in terms of our fears of AI replacing humans, in terms of us thinking that these machines will basically destroy our civilization or not. We have to always keep that in mind of, of the role we have in, still we have in prompting 
and also in receiving receiving the answers from the machines. Of course, the emergence, of course, the emergence and advancement of AI puts individual authorship in question. But as it does that, as it replaces the predictive, normative, and standard understandings of some of an issue, topic, a phenomenon, this whole process will elevate and hyper signify the authenticity which is impossible to still automate. So as lower level of understanding becomes outsourced, lower levels of labors of writing becomes outsourced to the machine, the more significant, more significant becomes those parts that are not outsourceable, which are done by the human, the author, the artist. And I think that's where the power of what you're about to do in this seminar lies of how you will be able to decide what part of the work you can outsource to these tools with which you'll be working on and how much of authorship and how much of um, authenticity you're able to, first of all, produce through your prompts by receiving more authentic responses from AI, but also to go in and add it or edit what AI has given you with your own mind, with your own hand, and improve upon whatever it is that, that, that you're able to get as a result of your prompt from the machine. Now, moving on. Down oh, just one thing. Can you yes. tilt your can you tilt your camera a little bit? Is it yes, better? Yes, because when you come on much better. Thank you. Yeah. So, but one of, one of the interesting points in the text that I think is very important to focus on is the distinctions made by Boris Groys between when you trigger a machine to have a response or when you prompt it, or the difference between a machine when a machine reacts to something or when the machine interprets something, right? And this is sort of like, that is the difference between, as Boris Groys talks about, pushing a button and seeing a predetermined process begin the production of something from nothing to something and prompting, which basically through the art of crafting a sentence, you're able to make, make the machine sort of like does a particular type of intentional labor in terms of searching the available data and stringing together what it imagines to be what it is that you're looking for. And this is kind of important because of reasons not embedded in the text. And in my opinion, if as the text argues that AIs are historical beings, just like how social, our social systems are historical, that there's an example made that like, say for instance, a rock responds to gravity the way it does today as it did millions of years ago. Whereas humans relationship to their social systems evolves rapidly even in the last 30 years because th the understanding of justice, the understanding of fairness, the understanding of what is good constantly changes, but so does our social systems, right? So. So basically, if human, if the human subject is historical, Boris Groys concludes that AI, because of the changing nature of the data, the, the, the increasing amount of data that machines sift through in order to respond to you is changing. Therefore, AIs are historical too. What is missing from his argument is the fact that not only the result, not only the amount of data available for AIs to sift through when they respond to our prompts are changing, but that AIs are able to keep track of the type of questions that are asked from them and the type of answers to, to, to these questions. And out of this will come a meta understanding of how this vast amount of data that they access relate to each other based on both the answer, the question, the prompts, and the responses. At that level, our machines going through their own historicity 
will arrive at a higher level of understanding upon which then what we call AGI principles can be then maybe drafted. And this is a very important distinction here. And unfortunately, the text does not at all talk about AGI, but I don't know how much about AGI you, you are aware of, but if our AIs right now basically are probability machines that basically are able to more and more accurately estimate the next string of letters and the next string of words or the type of pictures that correspond to our questions. In an AGI situation, you have machines that have a more human-like understanding of the world and they have a sort of like meta form of understanding of the, to the total knowledge that they, that they possess and they're able to connect these things and alive at a more sort of like genuine human-like level of understanding. Basically, in, in, in technical definition, AGI is an AI that is able to perform all, all sorts of human tasks, both in terms of cognitive and, and labor. Like, for example, an example of it is like, if a machine can go to a house and figure out how to make coffee without any instruction by knowing like, okay, I'm going to go to the kitchen. That's where the coffee is made, okay? Uh, Cupboards I have to open, but I'm going to find a coffee, if not in a freezer, in the fridge, if not in a cupboard. And basically, there, there, are, there are other tests that they, Turing tests will be one, one of the earliest ones, right? And AI, is, AGI also is referred to as strong AI or universal AI. And I think, I think it will be interesting to see how, through our use, we will determine the history of the future AI. Would our, is our use able to turn what is AI today and help to develop something more AGI? With all, all the fears and dangers that AGI's, AGI has possessed, because if we actually get to a very powerful or strong AI, you will not be able to fully control it. And, and hence all these cries of danger that we've heard coming from tech bros and a whole set of AI ethicists who all have come together to kind of cry about the dangers of dangers of the AI development. Now, in, in the text, what's interesting is, is the notion of the return of the author with prompt writing, right? Because the argument is that if as Foucault and uh, post-structuralists argued that like author is irrelevant because the intentions of the author can never be determined and because the text text itself is subject to multiple and diverse and opposing types of interpretation. So the author's intention doesn't even matter anymore. With prompt writing, we're, we're entering this era that author returns again. But I think this is a little bit of a wishful thinking. I think, I think author returns for maybe once and for all destroy the possibility of authorship altogether. If the author returns is to come is returning to commit suicide finally. And here what, what is what is what is interesting is a comparison that we can make between prompt writing and stage design, right? Because in stage design, one of the principles of classic stage design is that the stage designer is supposed to keep a very clear line of what is being staged, the illusions, the appearance of the environment, the vibe in which the play takes place, and then all the technologies and all the armatures and everything needed behind the stage that the viewers are not allowed to see that holds up the stage and its illusions for the play to take place, right? So... What we're, what, we're, what, we're, what we're seeing right now, I think, is basically prompt writing kind of like parallels this, this type of understanding of stage design, where you ask your questions, you write your prompts, and then it's the result that you will be showing or the results that you will be using. Rarely, rarely, unless you share your chat GPT sort of like link, Rarely people are able to see or read what your prompt was versus what the answer was. In fact, the whole fun 
and the whole ability of using it to replace your work or help you in, in projects depends on the fact that people don't see the prompt and only see the result, right? Now, as the AIs become in that historical development that we just earlier talked about, as our AIs move into understanding our questions, AI will move into ask its own questions from its own corpus, develop its own questions. That's where we start to get close to, maybe we won't even need prompt writers because we have to think about the moment when, when, when prompts themselves are being developed in order to access this unlimited amount of knowledge and data that's out there that needs to be sifted through and formalized and they won't even need us for asking the question, but hopefully we're still not there yet. So, but it's something to keep in mind that like this historicity will inevitably get there. And that's why I think at the end of the text, the, the recommendation that Boris Groys offers us that like, okay, if you really wanna be subversive or critical with AI, ask it nonsense questions, ask it question that exposes its, uh, its sort of like sick logic, be paradoxical with it. Let's just read that last part because the last part is something to keep in mind as participants in the workshop, but also understand the limits of it. It's, it's something that you can work with, but it's not something that you can 100% depend upon and expect your projects to become authentic as a result of following this type of uh, prescriptions, right? So let's just go back to it. So it says, if the accumulated mass of writing and documentation is not accessible to the human mind, it is accessible to AI. Today, prompting seems to be the only way to communicate with this objectified writing, this embodied zeitgeist. The prompting manuals that I quoted earlier recommended that readers adapt the style of their prompts to the clear and distinct thinking that we tend to associate with logical machines. However, as you have seen, AI operates by processing a mass of writing that has been accumulated in a fragmentary and chaotic manner. The logical structure of the text generated by AI is illusory. To investigate and diagnose the mass of accumulated writing, one has to use not clear and distinct, but paradoxical and provocative prompts that put the organizational principles of AI into question and reveal the chaos hidden behind the smooth surface of its results. Sounds very fun in the first instance, right? In fact, when I first began experimenting with, with uh, ChatGPT, I was very star startled by how easy it is to get fun responses or paradoxical responses through playing these games with playing these types of games with the machine. I'll give you an example. I was asked by many people to bring, bring it up in a class is that, as you know, ChatGPT understands most spoken languages. My mother tongue is Farsi. So I usually communicate with ChatGPT both in Farsi, in Farsi or in English. And comparing the results in, in, in these two languages have been a, a sort of like a favorite new pastime of mine, just to see how they operate and try to understand the logic of the algorithms, right? So one day I asked the Farsi version of ChatGPT, uh, can, a, can a woman have a penis? The Farsi response after a few flashes was that this is an immoral question and it's a political question and the answer to it is already in a question I refuse to answer this question. I said, okay. So I opened a new window and I asked in English, can a woman have a penis? And the answer right away was like, yes, a trans woman that hasn't gone through full, full biological transition, chances are she possesses a penis. And then the, the, the continuation of the response was a brief description of the difference between gender and sex and how this should not create a categorical problem for the woman with penis to identify as a woman. Granted, good question. When I asked, while I was in the window, I asked, okay, so now my second question was like, if a man refuses to date a woman solely based on the fact that she has a penis, does that make that man a transphobe? And the answer was, yes, it, it is if, if, the, if, if the man 
decided not to date a woman solely on the basis that she has a penis, this is a transphobic, this can be taken as transphobia. And, but when I went back to the, to the Farsi window and I asked the same question in Farsi that like, if a, if a woman with a penis, if, if, if a man refuses to date a woman with a penis, is that transphobia? The result was only if he explicitly discloses to the woman that I am not dating you because you have a penis. Because if he does not disclose that, we cannot jump to the conclusion that this was transphobia. We have to take it as two people ultimately have to like each other in order to date. And there could be other reasons why he did not date that woman. But if he explicitly states that, yes, it's transphobia. And so we, by other, but this, this was a very like a dramatic example, but I ran many other culturally sensitive questions through Farsi and English through these systems. And I realized that uh, it's true that as Boris Grois mentioned, prompt writing bring back the bring back the author to the scene and it kind of negates the post-structuralist post-structuralist notion of uh, death of the author. But on the other hand, actually, the use of chat GPT renews the idea of discourse because if you think about it, Farsi language is not used around the world. There are not many societies that use this language that then will create a diverse set of cultural values that are being coded in Farsi. Farsi is mostly used in Iran and Iran unfortunately has been controlled by a religious dictatorship for the last 40 years, which means the production of knowledge in Farsi has been heavily censored and controlled by the Iranian state. So then if the large language model is using the corpus of Farsi text available to it, of course it's going to give us answers that are contradictory not only incompatible, but contradictory to the stuff we, we ask ChatGPT in English because the, because, the, 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 because the discursive power from which it draws its conclusions are controlled by those who control the discourse, which is the Iranian state and, and the universities affiliated with the state and professors affiliated with the universities, affiliated with the state and researchers working for those professors in those institutions, right? Whereas... Unlike, unlike other forms of human knowledge, there's no universal ethics right now that will then come in. That will be a type of AGI, right? A universal type of ethics that come in and basically prioritizes and organizes these, these incompatible and often contradictory forms of knowledge in some form of hierarchy in terms of which one is more crucial, which one overrides the other. And that's why what we're dealing with is basically we are in a period that the prompt writer actually has a lot of power because it is through your prompts that you're able to basically formalize the type of knowledge that this machine can produce as a result of your prompt. So just before machine began, begin writing their own prompts and just between when we're moving from typing things to Google and asking for links, now we're typing things to a machine, we're prompting machines. This is a period in which actually we have a lot of power, not only to produce new knowledge as a result of our interactions with the systems, but to maybe even set the direction of where AGI is going through the type of questions that we're massively producing around the world. Because our questions themselves are a form of knowledge in negative that these machines will use to basically learn from us. So if we ask more sophisticated question, if we ask better question, if our questions help them sort of like find better type of answers for our questions, we're hopefully helping develop better forms of AGI. AGIs that will have some kind of humanistic ethics built into them via our use and practice, not just by sitting and preaching or idealizing or what kind of AI you should have. So that's why I have a, a lot of hope for where this seminar and seminars like this are going with sort of like interacting with machines, because I think this is a moment where we, we have a lot of agency in terms of the work we, we're going to do with these machines, that kind of influence we have on their 
future. I don't know for how long I've spoken, but I think I'm I'm, I'm almost close to it. And I want to like open it up to some questions, see if people have any questions because uh... we have some questions in the chat. Aizel uh, yes, yes. asked uh, uh, a question. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Aizel is asking about, she's particularly concerned about the the question, the question of AI prompting is, itself, and uh, what would be the intention behind AI prompting itself? Because, like, would would wouldn't it be a conundrum where we prompt it to prompt itself? And well, the thing is, logical. the thing is, you we we just have to think speculative, right? You have to really keep your speculative mind open. A pattern will emerge in type of type of prompts we're making. Machines are able to recognize patterns, right? Once they recognize the pattern in the kind of questions we're asking, probably they'll begin by asking very similar questions because they learn from these patterns, right? So we're really the teachers. So, so this is this is what I think is the beginning of the answer to this very complex question that you put forward to me, right? So yeah, it, it, it is recursive, but it is recursive to what they've learned from us. So that's why it's important the questions we're asking asking AI today will have an ethical implications for the future. I just remembered a funny thing we uh, we actually discussed uh, close to that uh, ChatGPT roundtable uh, we organized Mo, which was uh, that th there was a recent paper that got launched that talked about the capacity of uh, of devices such, uh, such as ChatGPT to actually train. Uh, pattern recognition devices like Mechanical Turk, for example, from Amazon. And then you have this very ironic thing in which uh, the machine-based training was actually better than the human-based training for the first time. And uh, and so so I think it, it closes that conundrum and like, complexifies it also relating it to a certain uh, type of uh, labor. Uh, there, there, we have two... Yeah, we, we have two comments, I think, by... One by Peggy, one by Diana. I, I think I might invite them to uh, elaborate if you think that like I might be misrepresenting it, but I'm just uh, reading the chat. Uh, yeah, so basically she, she's asking about uh, whether this uh, definition of like a universal ethics through AI would be, could be like the, uh, as an elitist thing, precisely because a, whole, a lot of populations are not going to be uh, represented in this shape of a new universal ethics and like, also not representing in the usage of prompt prompt writing, and uh, I think this uh, there is a there's another one by Diana in which he she claims that uh, as people are already programming bots to spam AIs with carefully corrected prompts, uh, what what is those ethics implication? I I right? try I, I I try to answer that. I think I think as far as open AI is concerned, they have a they have a way of really monitoring prompts and censoring them. And even banning people if you if you insist on asking problematic questions from the AI. But yeah, it, these are all new territories, and I think stuff that we need to keep an keep an eye on. There are also like this new one I learned about called Freedom Chat GPT. Have you heard about that? That you can download it. You can download the entire large language model. You need a M2 Mac chip or something really fast to run it on your machine. But you can basically run these very similar to ChatGPT systems locally on your machine, and it would actually answer all your questions, and it would actually have no censorship built into them. And these these are, I think, for me, systems like this. But then also true open open AI, open AIs, AIs whose algorithms are not only open for us to see, but open for us to democratically or through sort of like uh, DAOs or, or decentralized autonomous organizations who get involved, we can determine what kind of algorithms they have, what kind of questions are are allowed to be asked, what kind of questions will then be added to the machine learning of the AI from itself, what kind of questions will be excluded. These are all new territories. And I think this is a very important question to ask right at this moment by us. And about the question of how how privileged we are to be able to do this. Yes, it's true. We're very privileged. Not only we're privileged, we're also offering these tools 
to societies whose uh, social systems are far behind in terms of developing local versions of this. So not only we're privileged to use them, we're also privileged to invite others in, in, in global south or underdeveloped countries to use them to then steal their data, steal their knowledge, steal their wisdom and incorporate it into our systems because these systems essentially run on American servers that belong to Western Europe or American uh, corporations. And even if people in the global south are able to access them at the end of the day, they might not be benefiting from their participation as much as uh, the companies who run these machines benefit or the countries who then these, the states who are basically in charge of these companies in terms of governmental policy benefit from them. So there's even more this privilege. I mean, there's, there's this privilege in not using, not being able to use them. There's also more this privilege in actually using them when you don't own these systems. And one of the trends, I don't know if you've noticed or not, is like artists or people, I don't know how effective this is, but artists or people basically decide to pull their images offline because they don't want systems like Midjourney to use their images to develop prompt-based AI images. Uh, and writers deciding that they don't want their books to be read by AI to be added to the chat GPT. So these are also like some kind of like pushback and resistance that's happening, happening right now in order to kind of like make a like a more more level playing field yeah we have a question from Kadesh. i think i think you're seeing it right very good question i actually learned this very quickly that because i don't exercise farsi much first of all when i first started talking farsi to jack gpt because of how you learned your mother tongue unconsciously when you were a child i had to really stop myself from thinking that I'm speaking to a higher authority like God or a religious authority because, because ChatGPT's Farsi was so much better than mine and so much better than anybody else I had spoken Farsi even in a long time. And I was overwhelmed by its linguistic authority. And I had to constantly remind myself, don't worry, this is just a machine mimicking human well-written Farsi. This is really not, you're not really talking to somebody. And this is actually the best recommendation I can have with you is that just think of, Prompt, prompt writing as a more sophisticated form of Google search. Imagine you're writing a Google search that being fed to 50 or 100 Googles, and then there's a machine that read and analyzes all those answers and then provide you an answer live. That's really what you're doing at this level because we don't have AGI. We don't have machines that actually understand the world and give you answers based on a to totality of understanding like, like a, a wise person does. These machines are basically are unaware of the connections that exist within these large swaths of data that they can search and basically use to, to develop your answers. They're unaware of the depth and basically the consequence of this knowledge coming together to forming a kind of unitary meta-knowledge. These machines are not able to do that. So when you're interacting with them, you're basically interacting with a, with, with a machine with 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 a dignified or or glorified search engine basically but the more you use it the more you realize it's just like asking the right question from google you we already know the difference between a bad search and a good search on google so it's just like that and of course uh 10 years of working with google made us much better researchers so 10 years or so of working with chat gpt or or mid journey will make us much better at our own language, use of our own language, which is English or whatever language you use. So yeah, totally, I completely agree with you. So I just wanted to say that like, um, I think there was a, there was a, there was an introduction of the other guests already, right? But like we have a stellar set of guests who have, uh, who have agreed to appear um, my work particularly is I'm interested in, in Ramalo's presentation and I might show up for it, but also for Erica Love. But on top of that, we have two other, two other guests, John Raffman, who is a great artist who has been incorporating AI in his artistic production. He will be appearing as a guest, but I really think at least as far as text writing is concerned, and I think as far as learning how to save time and how to what to outsource and how to outsource your work to ChatGPT, I think 
I think Ramalo's seminar, the seminar in which Ramalo appears is going to be very valuable because he's going to come with a lot of amazing, a uh, lot of amazing like uh, insights in how to automate your uh, sort of like writing and planning your writing, writing with ChatGPT as he's been saving a lot of time during his own PhD research right now using ChatGPT. And that's one reason uh, Sebastian and Yomoka ask him to come is because he has amazing hands-on experience. And then John will have amazing hands-on experience on how to create compelling original images using Midjourney. And I think there are people coming who also work with video. And also I think Erica's appearance will be really interesting for those who are interested in the observe, in the humoristic side, how to, how to basically uh, um, uh, tickle the AI, how to tickle AI. I think that will be the best way to characterize what, what Erica and Joao have been doing with, with ChatGPT is tickling it into making it laugh. And then as a result, making us laugh. So whatever projects you're doing, I really hope that this seminar will help you sort of like gain knowledge and experience in incorporating uh, AI tools in your creative endeavor. And yeah, good luck. Oh, but by the way, I send my copy of the Boris Groys paper with my notes and my underlines for those because I really think it's a very important text and it's very important in the beginning of the seminar that people read it and form their opinion about how they feel, what they feel about what Boris is talking about here. Does It's not about accepting what he's saying. It's just about understanding the frame that he sets for these type of tools and then kind of like determine where you stand in relation to where people like Boris Groy stand in relation to these AI tools. So yeah, so I will I will send this for Raphael and I ask him to somehow email, email my copy with underline and notes to everyone. Thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, Jomoko, for inviting me. Yes, super interesting. Um, it's actually completely my approach because I want to get like the craziest picture out of mid journey. You know, I want to, it's, 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 because uh, mid journey itself has like a, a specific look and you you just want don't want to have that you know you don't want to look or sound like all the others you want to uh, so this uh, is this is actually interesting you say that i just wanted to add you know the question of genre becomes very important as rafael was telling me earlier on before the class that like that like these tools right now are able to sort of like mimic different literary or aesthetic genres through prompting, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, but but the question is how to not be happy that like, oh, look, it totally mimicked Hemingway style of writing for me. That's, I think to me is a little bit like boring, right? But how to sort of like make hybrids of it, how to sort of like push these tools to create new genres, out of what they know and what you're asking them, like how your prompt writing basically enables to hopefully enables to the production of like genres that then other people will copy you and say, oh my God, look, they asked that. And I think part of part of this part of this exercise, a workshop would be to not be so greedy and actually share your prompts. At, I mean, of course, at some level, you want to be very private about your prompts because your final project, you want it to be yours. But I think it's important that people share their prompts and share what, not only share the great results you get, but actually share with each other uh, what kind of questions or prompts you wrote in order to get those great results. And I think it's it's great to sort of like develop, to share these experiences so people would collectively elevate their prompt writing skills. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it was actually the plan for the first exercise, you know, to actually kind of like come up with some interesting themes and then we can see and get together and yeah, see what prompts we wrote in order to get these nice results. Amazing. So I will just, I want to leave because I, I my, my presence could be intimidating. I'm just going to leave, but I'll be, I'll be closely following every session and also I'm there because I appeared as a guest. If you have any questions, also as the organizer of the news center, I'm always there. So if you have any questions or concern, you can directly email me, mohammed.salemi at the news center.org. And also if you just make any emails, eventually, maybe a day or two later, I will hear about it and I will respond to it. 
Thank you very much again, guys, for inviting me. It's an honor to be your guest. I love your work, and I'm a big fan of your work, both with AI and outside of AI. You're great designers and great creators. So I think you, you, you'll be doing great in the seminar. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. So this was like the first better half of this first seminar. And we are looking forward to, yeah, to, to, to get now really hands-on for the first session. So basically, we all open now JetGPT. Yeah, maybe I can share my screen. Okay, let's do it like this. Because you, you, you prepared already uh, certain things. Yeah, I think, it, I think that maybe just makes a little bit more sense. Uh, first thing to think about while I'm opening this up, Mm -hmm. um, is that you should never put any sort of uh, okay I'm not able to share for some reason that you are admin or yeah it's maybe something to do with my my laptop so maybe then you can share your screen that's not a problem so the first uh, thing I want us to look at is why bot and i'm gonna now send all of the just send send it to me in telegram or stuff yeah yeah so it's really important to to know that whenever you put anything into chat gpt or anything that is running the chat gpt api like why bot for example that you lose all copyright over whatever you've put in so if you are a writer and you're working on a story, I highly recommend not putting anything, any of your texts into uh, ChatGPT and only putting in, uh, yeah, using it for prompting, not putting in anything which you don't mind uh, losing, basically. Just a little side note. Um, but yeah, so we're going to look at two tools. The first one is Ybot, and Ybot basically uses the ChatGPT API, but it uh, reformats your questions into basically a mind map style yeah, okay, okay. Uh, output. So you only have five prompts, so don't go crazy on them. But I use this tool often just in terms of brainstorming. So, for example, in this case, when we're thinking about, you know, creating this short story, um, maybe we could start with something like uh, what would be what is important to consider when creating a short story, just so we kind of like see how it's working. Um, you guys can also already start to play around with it and, you know, customize it in your in your own way it's working exactly the same as what when i make a short story okay boom so as you can see it takes your question or your prompt and it breaks it down into many different uh possible considerations i use this personally a lot in my creative flow so i often have to do stuff uh in terms of ideation for game mechanics and this kind of thing. And it can also be a really interesting way just to validate something that you're already thinking. So for example, I've decided that I want to write a story about um, two girls that go out into space and fight aliens. And because I believe that it will appeal to Gen Z. And then I can actually use Ybot to formulate an argument for why that could be actually, uh, yeah, an interesting, an interesting case. So I think that this can be quite a good tool in terms of uh, brainstorming. Yeah, it's just like out of one question, it, it, it formulates 10 other conclusions or, 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 or tips itself, where exactly. to bring it. And this is just like, whoo, why is the banana curved? Or any question itself. And you get you get the 360 uh, thought kind of. But also, um, yeah, you need to see if it's using uh, GPT-3 or 3.5 or 4. 
that's kind of the stuff. And um, yes, this was the Y bot thing. This is very interesting. You Moke should we explain them basically the, the the exercise one and exercise two? Yeah, I think we can just uh, go straight into exercise one. So exercise okay. one, what we need to do is we want to create five short like one liners describing like the plot for some short stories. And it's essentially just like, let's get our toes wet a little bit with ChatGPT. Um, so maybe uh, we can go to ChatGPT now and start to actually give this a try. So the most important thing to, uh, to consider is in this case, there's a very clear output that we want, right? We want to have a specific result, which is five short one-liners. So it's important to make sure when you're writing your prompts that first of all, you have all of that uh, necessary information that is going to make ChatGPT give you the answer that you want. For example, if you would, uh, if you would say create five, uh, five descriptions for a plot of a short story, then they might be too long, right? And there's some certain stuff that we want to include here, uh, yeah, in order to get the results that we want. So as you can see, it's interesting actually, because I ran this same prompt before and it's basically come up with the pretty much the same results. And this is where prompt writing uh, becomes so important, right? And actually you bringing your creative flair to it is essential. Otherwise you're just gonna end up with, we're all gonna end up with the same thing. Um, so, uh, maybe let, let's go to the live one, Sebastian. Yes. And let's stay in here. So if we were going to kind of like start to remix this, we don't want any of these ideas that have just come out. Uh, none of them are really interesting enough. Yeah. So as uh, Mohammed already suggested, like what are some things that we could do in order to start to shape this in a way for ourselves? So some things we could consider are, you know, that it is a story from a particular era? Is there a particular setting? Is there a particular uh, genre that we want? Or is it uh, more to do with, you know, it should be in the style of a certain person or perhaps like mixing a couple of different, uh, these things. So for example, maybe you would say, okay, create five short one-liners describing the plot of a short story, which should have the same structure as, you know, the poem, The Lady of Shalott, but it should be written by George Orwell and set on Mars in 2087. And it'd be great if you guys can also also start to play around with it and try it out because we will be sharing our results. So now we should let anyone uh, just work for 10 minutes on him on, on him own to experience certain things. Okay. So let's um, meet nine five again with this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. you. Let's do it, okay? So everyone takes 10 minutes time for the first exercise. And if anyone has any questions, then we'll be here. Okay. Uh, we break after meeting back, right? Or... We break into the separate rooms, or...? Yeah, yeah. 
like after we meet back this 10 minutes, right? Yeah, I think we can all join together then and we can go through some of the prompts, which um, the results we got and what we asked in order to um, to get that. And then, yeah, then we can break out into the separate rooms for exercise two and three. Okay, good. Okay, also I stop screen sharing that uh, anyone can see his own screen. Okay, I'm just getting back to the to the final bit. Okay, so I think the best way to do this, because obviously there's quite a few people, um, we're only going to share like one one of the concepts that it came up with. And then we can just talk about, all right, what was the the prompt that we used in order to, to get to that? So maybe Sebs, you can start. Just like one of the one of the nice ones. I mean, then I need to share my, my screen. Or you can just uh, copy and paste it into the into the chat so everyone can can read it and also just uh, say just it out it. loud. I just do it quick kind of stuff. Um, I copy and pasted the thing from the test, but I wrote, I should include artists like Martin Kippenberger because I really like him. And I spoke yesterday about the Nitro uh, project and uh, I really like the ideas of thought portals as the main part of the theory. So it gives me five, uh, five things itself. Um, and then I wrote a little bit, please write it in the style of a computer hacker with a psychosis and it should feel like a Quentin Tarantino and remixes a lot of other films. So this kind of stuff. And uh, also integrate a sequence where the soul from Malcolm McLaren, one of the founders of Punk, comes to life as a hologram. So basically, okay, um, already integrating uh, uh, um, exercise number two which means create a full plot description for minimum 500 words, experiment with the, in the style of XXX. Um, yes, this kind of stuff. So for me, awesome. it was a computer hacker with a psychosis and mood swings and stuff like that. And um, so I can't read everything itself, but I don't like the word Neo Muse or stuff like that. And then I tell the machine, uh, it should have more weird mute swings and uh, please change the new news uh, to something more futuristic and it comes up with Neuromachina. For now, this is where I'm at. So I will just like copy and paste. I think and... we don't need the full the full 500 because uh, yeah, we just want to do like the first first exercise, right? Which is like the five, yeah, yeah, the five points. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Um, who who else want who wants to go first? Otherwise, I will pick someone. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I mean, we just go the alphabet. So okay. you know, someone with with H has to start. We have yeah. Anna. Please. Hi. Uh, should I just? Oh, sorry. Um, read what I created. Or yeah, what? just like one of the the nice ones that came out, and then we can talk about the prompt. Um. Okay, let me choose one. Uh. So yeah. The. <laughs> um. Yeah. Let's go for the first one. The title is uh, Neon Nights. Um. Amid the tantalizing in glow of planet prism. Jamie, an exiled psychosidian dancer, graces the stages and alleys, uh, combating stigmas and searching for self-worth um, as neon passions flare. Uh, um, and it, this uh, came about from the uh, prompt um, with the style of mixing um, Erwin Balsh and Maggie Nelson about marginalized people and sex workers. Um, and yeah, there is also like a sci-fi player of Octavia Butler. 
that's that was my prompt very nice and why did you why did you pick those things is it just like a personal interest did you think that uh it would uh yeah um i do research on sex work and pornography that's why i uh, and recent ever awesome Okay, because um, we just don't, we don't have very much time. Let's so let's uh, let's rush through this. Uh, Isil, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I um I, I'm not satisfied with my results, and That's okay. uh, I I think like in general, I took this course to be satisfied with my results when I talk with this machine because yeah. I'm not as enchanted as other people. <laughs> let's say of course it's magical but also a bit um problematic i wanted to write a story about food and the caspian sea because uh, that's uh, what i am engaging in now and it gave me first under the caspian sun a fisherman's fortune shifted with each tide as he cast his net into the ancient waters weaving tales of seafood bounty upon the shore and also i don't know why but it used a lot of the of the word bounty in general mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that's me. That's it. Interesting. And what was the what was the prompt that you used to for that? Uh, create a short one liner of a story about sea uh, and uh, food on the shore of the Caspian Sea. Very yeah. simple. I mean, the thing is, is that it's really there are a couple of different ways you can approach this. Like the first one is okay. I have to write. The perfect prompt to get this perfect result right but the other way is that you can do it a little bit more conversational so maybe you get this result back and you're not happy with it and you say please don't write it don't write it in this tone it needs to be in the tone of a theoretical paper and I want it to explore these themes very deeply and all of this kind of stuff so I think you know it can be quite hard to get it right the first time and you know there's always this other way of approaching it which is then just telling it okay yes but change this change that it can be quite uh, helpful as well I think it's just a small remark. I, I think uh, like power to what Mo was saying before about Persian language and uh, uh, English language. I think because I want him to, uh, not him, actually them or it, to um, give me something particular about a region that is not very well researched. It doesn't give me the results that I want. And yep. I guess um, like this, this knowledge production thing and like the zeitgeist thing like works in this prompts and the you being like you and prompt and etc. Like just yeah. want to do that. One thing that you can do actually is you can input the information that you want it to consider. So if you would have a, a document that you feel talks about this region very well, then you can give it that document and say, now write me this, uh, the five short stories. So I think there's a couple of different ways of approaching it, but yeah, this is very cool. And Karina? Hey. Um, okay, I put it in the, whoop, sorry, this doesn't work. Um, okay, sorry. That's all right. I hope this is working now. Why not? Copy, paste. It's not working, sorry. Uh, I don't know why. Like, um, 
Is it possible right. they don't have editing rights or something? Or uh, what is what are you trying to do? I'm just trying to paste it into the um into the chat. Yeah. Mm, that's weird. You should be able to should be able to do that. Um, mm. Okay, maybe I can jump to the next person. Yeah. And then, okay. I'll then, try. If I, if I manage, then uh, yeah. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, Selini. I I think Selini has uh, issues with her camera, but she had okay. submitted hers on the on the chat. Okay. I can uh, let me try to get back to her. It's pretty, uh, yeah, her first prompt that she gave was create a short story that begins with an event that is interrupted and then a new story begins because a good plot needs something to happen. And uh, But I'm not sure she sent the outcome yet, so you might want to send it, Selene. Um, while Selene uh, shares it, I think, I think I can briefly like just talk about mine. I wanted to... I experimented with two questions actually. So I, I asked him to give me him. It, it's funny that we always personalize it, right? Yeah. Like in that particular way. Uh, but uh, I asked him to first talk about the transition from uh, in RPGs from 2D to 3D and turn-based battle to real-time battle. And then I, I wanted it to come up with a narrative that deals with this generation of change and what does it mean for uh, RPG players. I found that it did a very interesting thing because uh, it didn't talk about nostalgia at all, but it spoke about like uh, every. Uh, I'm going to read it quickly. It's called Exo Echoes of Pixel. Uh, in the kingdom of Retro Reprotopia, the world exists in beautiful pixelated 2D. Citizens live in side scrolling towns, venture through top down forests, and battle creatures in turn based combat. They uh, they tell tales of heroes from the pixel era, grand adventures chronicled in 8-bit and 6-bit theories, but a myth persists, a legend of a world beyond pixels where depth exists beyond two dimensions and battles occur in real time. This world, referred to as Tridonia, is dismissed by many as mere folklore. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, you gave it a really interesting theme there, right? Which is like the uh, transition from 2D to 3D. And yeah, we know that nothing, no one else will have a similar plot to you because you created this unique prompt which is why it's so important actually what's really interesting uh, but i think we can go on to maybe diana hi i haven't put mine in the chat yet okay, okay. you can also read it if okay. you want so a lot of my uh responses were kind of the same because i sort of over determined the prompt but this one is uh, representative. A billionaire's desperate bid <clears throat> to survive the apocalypse inside his fortified bunker leads to an ill-fated journey on a repurposed duck boat, culminating in a transformative wreck on Martha's Vineyard that fuels a worldwide uprising, ultimately birthing a new era of shared prosperity through socialism. Wow. And what yeah. was the prompt that you gave it to get this result? Pretty much that exact thing, just okay. reworded. Um, I belong to an art collective, and we're working on this as a project for a possible diorama. So um, it's kind of something I thought it'd be fun to bring to the class and work on. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. M mega nice. There's so much already. Uh, I, I can feel the the curiosity and the energy already in all directions. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm happy already with this. Regarding the time, we have 11 more minutes, you know, and um, I'm just like, um, so please all share your story basically um, for now in the chat. And we, uh, we will just like really uh, brief you already kind of um exercise number three boop, 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 boop. exercise number three uh when you're happy with like exercise two already the next thing um make a script with timestamps and short list for a 20 second video or a 20 image graphic novel that's kind of the thing uh which we want to do till uh, in uh, two weeks 
So this is basically the exercise, I mean, for now, for these 10 minutes, but also for the next 14 days. So because in the session number two, which we will have uh, on the 30s, um, we will start the image generation uh, session with talking about uh, the ideas already. So part of the um, 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 uh, exercise three will be already be parts of the prompts which you then rework to create those pictures. So this is essential for the whole thing. And, uh, but I also know that this will be super interesting. Um, yeah, cool. I think the best thing we can do is maybe we can split up still into the groups and then we can individually, uh, myself, Sebastian, uh, take you through exercise two and exercise three. So you really understand like our process. Um, yeah. And we just see how much we can do in the the last last few minutes. Uh, yeah. Do you want to break us up into the, the groups? Hey, just one sec, let me stop the recording.